Good morning, everybody. It's a privilege for me to welcome Novartis Foundation for Sustainable Development and people also from the Ifakara Center in Tanzania to Columbia University. Uh, it's really great to have this conference together with you because we have partnered already six years ago, almost seven years ago, with Novartis Foundation that has been supporting some of our projects and work together with Novartis Foundation for Sustainable Development. And this is the first time we are reuniting here at Columbia to talk about some of our joint work and also individual work that the Earth Institute is doing in global health and that Novartis Foundation is supporting in other countries, uh, African countries. Uh, I don't want to take more time because we are already running a little bit late and would like to introduce uh, one of my two favorite guys, and this is my boss, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, the director of the Earth Institute and also special advisor uh, to the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, and he advises him on the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs is also director of a relatively new initiative, United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Uh, my other favorite guy is Professor uh, Klaus Leisinger, who is now president and chairman uh, of the Novartis Foundation for Sustainable Development, and who has really inspired me to work with the private sector and the private sector foundations that really believe in how to bring the corporate social responsibility in a responsible way into the global health research and implementation project. So, without further ado, uh, Jeff, please. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. What a pleasure it is to welcome colleagues from Novartis as well as colleagues from uh, many other parts of uh, the university and, uh, and the city, uh, a number of the UN uh, agency uh, public health leaders as well. Good morning, Jim, and uh, people from school of public health, medical school, and many other uh, people here eager to uh, have this chance to meet with the Novartis Foundation team on the Access Project, and I want to welcome our colleagues from Tanzania as well. We're very excited to hear uh, about your important work and to have a good discussion with you. And uh, Chris Langler, I have not had a chance to see for a number of years, and uh, he has just whispered how many exciting things are going on in Tanzania in terms of scaling up, and this is uh, in no small part due to his leadership and his team, so this is wonderful that you're, you're here. This is also uh, a Great chance for us to thank a very, very, very dear friend who remains a colleague on, on many ventures, Klaus Leisinger, uh, who has been the head of Novartis's foundation and its leader for a long time. I don't know exactly how many years, but uh, he has a worldwide reputation as one of the greatest leaders of uh, public health and of corporate responsibility uh, and has really been a, a beacon for all of us, a teacher, uh, a friend, a, a colleague, um, and an inspiration. And uh, it's always wonderful that you're here. Klaus is a core member uh, of many of our activities uh, and uh, has really helped to make the Millennium Villages project possible. Uh, he has innovated uh, all over the world, um, and he shared some of uh, some of that spirit and uh, insight with us uh, in, in our work in Africa. And we're welcoming uh, Anne Ertz, uh, who is the new president of uh, CEO. CEO, sorry, new CEO of the Novartis Foundation. And uh, what a pleasure and uh, honor to have you here. And. Uh, I can tell you this has been one of the most exciting and constructive uh, and creative relations that I've had in my professional life with Novartis, and both with the company and with the foundation. Because Novartis really took the lead many, many years ago on both sides, the corporate side and the foundation side, to make the most of its incredible 
uh, wealth of knowledge, its intellectual property, uh, and its the global scale. Uh, and uh, the uh, former, C I hope I get it right, CEO and President Daniel Masella and Chair uh, was one of uh, the very few people in the world that made possible the successes in the fight against malaria during the last decade because early on he said we have to make sure that the new frontline medicines, the Artemis and in combination therapies are really available and Novartis built one of the world's largest complexes with one of the largest throughputs of medicines, maybe even the largest uh, at, uh, in, to produce massive uh, amounts of the Artemis and in combination uh, therapies which are essential at doing a historic job of uh, bringing malaria under control. So we owe Novartis a lot. The world owes Novartis a lot. And we're always profoundly honored to be partnering with you. The topic today is access to medicine. We're going to hear about the Access Project, which has been underway in Tanzania for a number of years. And that theme is dear to our hearts <coughs> because we, like Novartis, we at the Earth Institute and in the Millennium Villages Project and in my work as Special Advisor to the Secretary General have felt for the past, I would say, 13 years, uh, at least since the Millennium Development Goals started, that the question of access to life-saving medicines and uh, preventative technologies like anti-malaria bed nets is at the core uh, of the practical and the moral question of how to achieve the Millennium Development Goals. We are living in an age where there are solutions to ancient scourges. Malaria is a 100% treatable disease and is a largely controllable disease. And yet it wasn't so long ago when at least one to two million children each year were dying. Now the numbers have come down because of the improvements of access that we're going to talk about. But the very practical challenge that all of us uh, have faced working with our colleagues in Africa is how to ensure access in very low income settings. Incidentally, uh, how to achieve access in very high income settings is also a major challenge and it's a, the other side of the spectrum that uh, the U.S. is grappling with uh, in this very neighborhood and some of the lessons that we're learning in Africa about community outreach, for example, have absolutely direct relevance for how our own healthcare system should be reformed. And so the lessons don't all flow in a, by, in, by any means in one direction. The whole global public health strategy constantly needs a rethink as technologies change and as delivery mechanisms change. One of the wonderful things about public health in the African context is that some of the worst killers, the pandemics, uh, of AIDS and malaria at the beginning of the last decade, which were completely out of control, found new diagnostics, new uh, preventative and new therapeutic and curative approaches during the past dozen years. And access then becomes really the defining element, how to ensure that those breakthroughs, rapid diagnostic tests, long-lasting insecticide-treated bed nets, uh, Artemis and in combination drugs, antiretroviral therapy and the, and the like, reach those who need it. And by definition, we're talking about access by people who have very, very little uh, purchasing power, uh, very little access to mobility, and perhaps not so much knowledge uh, to be able to uh, know uh, about uh, the, the best choices uh, that uh, they have in front of them. <coughs> so we've been grappling with this within the Millennium Villages and the Access Project of the Novartis Foundation has been grappling with this uh, challenge in Tanzania, so it's a great time for this discussion. One of the things that makes it very timely in particular for us that I want to mention 
is that one of our core conclusions, uh, and I trust that we'll find a resonance uh, with our colleagues from Tanzania, is that community health workers can play an enormously important role in ensuring access in the villages. Uh, we had up until 10 years ago for many uh, treatments, uh, for example, including diagnostics and treatment of malaria, a clinic-based approach, but people often lived 10 or even 15 kilometers away on foot from a clinic, and that meant uh, almost a death sentence for uh, countless uh, children uh, infected with malaria. Now, because of rapid diagnostic tests and the improved medicines, it's possible in concept to reach villagers within the villages, not at the facilities. But that requires trained, uh, supervised, managed community health workers. So having seen and learned that lesson and watched the success that uh, those community health workers can really bring about, we, together with uh, Klaus and with other partners, have been championing the scale, scaling up of community health workers. And it was a great honor for me, together with the CEO of Novartis, Joe Jimenez, and President Paul Kagame of Rwanda, to launch a community health worker campaign to train, deploy, remunerate, provision, supervise one million community health workers in Africa by the end of 2015. And this is a firm commitment of the Novartis Foundation, and the Novartis Foundation gave a $1 million gift to the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network to get this campaign started. A round of applause for the Foundation for that. So we had the chance to launch this in Davos, and then the next week we launched it uh, in uh, the African Union Summit, where the chairperson of the African Union Summit, Prime Minister Haile Mariam Dessalim of Ethiopia, gave a very rousing and strong backing for this initiative uh, in his opening speech at the African Union Summit. And our next rendezvous is in April, and again, this is the final point of contact, or not the last, but I mean the next point of contact, I would say, uh, and that will be a meeting at the Ifakara Center hosted by the Novartis Foundation. And uh, Dr. Prabjot Singh, if you raise your hand, uh, I think many people know uh, Prabjot, uh, is organizing uh, and leading uh, a technical session that will have about a dozen governments working on their scaling up uh, community health worker programs. So this is all very exciting. Obviously, the partnership is very strong, very robust, very dynamic, and I couldn't be more grateful. And with those uh, opening thoughts, it's my pleasure to uh, turn uh, the mic over to our very, very dear friend uh, and, uh, and guru, Klaus Leisinger, please. Thank you very much, Jeff. After such a kind introduction, the best thing would be not to talk, because it can only go downhill from now on. Okay, Albert Einstein once said one should make things as, possible, as simple as possible, but not simpler. And uh, if you look at access to medicine, it's very important. You know, Jeff has said uh, Novartis Foundation, which means we are part of the Novartis company. The Novartis company gives us all the funds that we are needing, and uh, we are not part of the marketing, we do not have to sell products, but we want to contribute to, on the one hand, solving problems in the health sector, on the other hand, strengthening health systems, but also, in a more wider sense, uh, give a pharma political message in the sense of, you know, what are the real problems behind poor people not having access to medicine. We at the foundation give away all the drugs that are needed to eliminate leprosy. And despite the fact that the drug is given away for free, don't you assume for a moment that the drugs are always where they are supposed to be? And if they are there, don't you assume that the people, the patients are taking them the way they ought to be taken? 
So availability of drugs is one thing, but there are a lot of other things. It has to do with technology available. It has to do with logistics, but it also has to do with good governance. It has to do with social values. It has to do with political processes. And as you are all from the, most of you are from the academic sector, you know, in the development stories, if you change something, you always step on somebody's foot. And if you, if you bring in progress and if you, if you, if you uh, get dynamics into the development project, uh, into the development process, some people are not so happy and are not going to support that. Now, what are the facts? The facts are that along with well-trained and motivated health professionals, pharmaceutical products, inclusive vaccines, are the most effective way to prevent, alleviate, and cure illnesses. I just two weeks ago had, uh, was in a leprosy project in India, and I can only tell you, look at people who had the bad luck of suffering, from, of, of becoming ill, of leprosy in the 60s and 70s and not having a chance to have access to a, a, a multiple drug therapy that cures. They are all blind, they all lost their noses, they all lost their feet, they lost their fingers, they lost their, their you know, they're incredibly disabled people because there were no drugs. And since the late 1970s, the multidrug therapy is available, and ever since that, you don't see that kind of mutilations anymore because it's treatable drug. And a lot of the drugs that, of the lot of the diseases and a lot of the preventable uh, <clears throat> mortality that we have in the developing world have to do, are solvable by medical products. And uh, this is why this is so important. And yet, the WHO estimates that about 2 billion people have inadequate or no access to essential medicines and vaccines. And according to the UNDP, the death toll is around 10 million people per year, 10 million who could be living if and when the drugs would be there where they're needed. Almost half of the available medicines are inappropriately prescribed, dispensed, or sold, leading to wasted resources and potentially resulting in harm to patients, meaning if you have solved the problem thus far, we run, for example, in West Africa into a, lot of, into a lot of fake drugs. So people think they take the right drugs and they do not have any impact on their health. And as I said a moment ago on leprosy, then the disease progresses with HIV AIDS, then uh, AIDS develops uh, and malaria, people can die. If the diagnosis is correct and prescription rational, patients often do not follow the prescribed regimen. Uh, our colleagues from Tanzania will give you the example on malaria in this respect. And uh, for the very poor people who do not have a health insurance, who do not have a lot of other things that we take for granted normally, if they are sick, 60 to 90% of the household expenditure on health goes into trucks. If you look at what at the end of the day makes people healthy or sick, what makes them survive or die, it has very much to do with the conditions into which they are born, into the which they, are, they grow up, into which they work and age, and that determines much more the, the, uh, that determines much more the morbidity and the mortality pattern than everything else. Meaning that if you do not eliminate or alleviate poverty every specific effort that we do, be it in health, be it in nutrition, be it in, uh, in education, is, uh, can't be as effective as one would wish because the poverty system is a slow-moving one, is a very persistent one, and uh, you have to have a lot of activities over a long time to really have a systematic impact. The people that we are talking about here is uh, they are uh, they do not have voice. It's a very much a political uh, issue, too, that this power distribution, the education distribution, the income distribution, the visibility of the poorest patients in the world is very bad, meaning if you have a, good, if you have a group of educated people asking for something in the capital, they can always stage a demonstration and will get away and will get the things they ask for. If, you ha if you're looking at people and 1.5 billion people are using all their daily energies to survive the daily battle for living, what would you expect them to stage 
as a, as a demonstration or to ask. Political influence is very important. Uh, political influence in the past years has been much more focused on cities and on non-agriculture and non-rural non issues. And uh, something that we are now starting, uh, uh, <coughs> the, the, the issues that the, the, the influence of the policy choices, we are not really able to influence. But if we start a successful one million community health worker campaign, that is development from below, that exerts pressure on change, and that is something that, uh, that we are hopeful about. The failure of health systems, and if that is, Margaret Chan has said that the failure of health system is at the center of the human crisis. And may I tell you, yes, I'm coming from a pharmaceutical company, but two good news are, there was the November conference in the World Bank on electrotropical diseases, and the World Bank voice was, Everything the pharmaceutical industry has promised has been delivered. Everything the governments have promised has not been delivered. So it's not blaming and shaming and naming, but you know, it is we are talking about one solution. We are not talking about partial solution. And whatever we are doing from a pharmaceutical industry, I will come back in a moment, has to be matched not only by civil society and academic institution like the one Jeff Sachs is heading, but also by the governments and by their, by their efforts to do something. Because the state of the health is part and parcel of the poverty system. It has to do with individual and collective poverty. It has to do with not ac having access to drinking water. It has to do with inappropriate sanitation. It has to do with everything that comes to our mind if we talk about poverty. And this yellow stone and this mosaic access to diagnosis and medical care is only one other system. It has again to do with voice. It has to do with, uh, with uh, good quality of, of uh, health uh, services offered. That's what we are going to talk about in a moment. So, you know, it is th the basic message is here. Let's never forget the complexity and the dimension of the issue we are discussing here. And this is why let's also face that any progress we'll, we make is incremental. There will not be the big things happening. Might be if we would have a vaccine against HIV-8, you know, maybe. But, you know, it's the permanent incremental progress that we make over years and years and years uh, that make the difference. I can tell you from a personal point of view, every end of the year I'm un I'm, I, I am unhappy because the year has passed and so many problems still are there, so many things have not been done. But if you look at things over five years or 10 years or 15 years, you really see something is happening. If you look at the malaria mortality, something was happening. And uh, this should, all, should, should give us all the, uh, the uh, uh, let me say, the optimism that uh, if every actor, a well-meaning actor that we get into multi-stakeholder solutions is doing his or her best, then uh, we can really do something. Let me finish with the toolbox of pharmaceutical companies if it comes to access to medicine. You can do differential pricing, which is done by a lot of companies, but this again depends on a lot of other factors. Let me give you an example. We are involved in a project with the Gates Foundation in the Philippines, and we are willing to give a differential prices for some of the most innovative drugs that we have. The big danger that we are facing and the political work that we have to do to prevent that is that in today's world there is a lot of external reference pricing, meaning that if Novartis gives the price for the poorest of the poor in the Philippines, that could become the, de the negotiation base for the government of Norway, for the government of Italy, or for the government of Belgium to discuss prices in Norway, Italy, or Belgium. And of course, Companies are not happy to give low prices for the poor if it is exploited by the governments of the rich. Patients assistance programs. We have a leukemia drug called Clevec, which is very, very simple. You have it and you live, or you don't have it and you die. And it should not be the patent and the price of a drug that decides upon living or dying of people. This is why we have a patient assistance program that basically says if somebody has a certain income or, and is not insured, he or she will get the drugs for, uh, drug for free, and that is a very successful project. Licensing for market failure, that's a bit more complicated, but happens. 
corporate philanthropy. That's what the Novartis Foundation has been doing. Pro bono research, Novartis has a tropical disease institute in, in, in Singapore where we are actively looking for malaria, for tuberculosis, for dengue, uh, for other poverty diseases, and whatever drugs comes out of that will be given without a profit to the world's poor. So, uh, you know, it's a comprehensive uh, portfolio that we are having here. And the program Cooperation with Development Institution, that's what uh, um, Jeff has mentioned, this one million community health worker initiative is one of these possibilities, is one of, is one of the examples. And uh, 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 I can promise you, on you will have a fascinating working environment, you will have fascinating colleagues, and uh, we have, together will have fascinating results. Let me stop here and say, there are a lot of companies today, and Novartis is one of the leading ones in this area, that has understood that there are people out there that wouldn't have the purchasing power to go through the normal commercial channels that we have. We are aware that they nevertheless are sick and need drugs, and we are willing to make a contribution towards solving these problems. But to be really successful in the long run is you need multi-stakeholder approaches, you need professional institutions like the Millennium Village uh, Project, the Millennium Promise Institution, the Earth Institute. You need governments, and Paul Kagame in this respect is an excellent example. You need good governance where people are allocating the scarce resources they have according to the priorities of the problems they have to solve. And you need an international community that is living up to the promises they have made and they are going to continue to make every five or six or seven years or so. But last sentence, if everything goes right, we will be successful. And it's our generation that has the opportunity and therefore the responsibility to make a difference. Thank you.